It's all right, respect, you see. Fellow redheads sit up the front, it's brothers in arms. Right, hello. Um, welcome to my per session on professional chanting. This is how to make a Power App. Um, I am a citizen developer, uh, which means that I have no formal training on how to make anything um, other than a great big bloody mess, right? Because that's what citizen developers do, we make messes for IT to clean up. If you're just in Claire's session, you'll hear about orphaned apps and citizen developers and oh, lions and tigers and bears, oh me, oh my, right? But I, I've got this um, method for making a Power App. I've been making Power Apps now for five years. I, I started just after it went GA, when a friend of mine said to me, um, have you seen this thing called Microsoft Forms? It's really cool. And I went into it and I went, this looks really cool. And I said, can you do a context-sensitive drop-down? Because I can do that in my Excel workbook that I've got shared on my pen drive. And you can't. OK, that's it. And no more forms. Thank you. And then I clicked on Power Apps, and I went, that looks really hard. And I turned it off, and I didn't come back for about a month. And then in December, I started making my first Power App. Right? I have made the same Power App over and over and over again ever since. Right? Well, within reason. Some of them are a little bit different, but it's generally the same thing. Now, when you get out of doing your basic layer of Canvas application, which is to update a data source, right? To update a SharePoint list, to update something somewhere, you're going to find that all of a sudden your low-code application all of a sudden has quite a lot of code, right? Because it does have quite a lot of code. And then when you've kind of done that, you've got to debug your code because you've made a mistake in it somewhere. And the little red spot at the top on the right-hand corner up there, the little stethoscope, it didn't say anything, right? Syntactically, you're right. But logically, you're not right. You're wrong. So how do you make this better? How do I make this more simple? How do I make this quicker? Because got to bear in mind, I am lazy. I'm a fundamental lazy developer. I would encourage you all to be lazy developers, right? Because you do it once, and we never do it again, because that's what coding's all about. So these amazing developers that are in the room in front of us, Tim, Julian, Dave, where's, where's Summit? Summit's down there, and others, you all did this in pro code, so why aren't we doing it in low code? Because it's not fair, because I'm like, not as clever as you lot are, right? Because I've got this, you know, coming in from driving buses and everything. So how am I going to do it? So the first thing, the number one first thing, is in my method for making Power Apps, is got nothing to do with being inside of a Canvas app. The first thing I do whenever I go and work for a new partner, new company, new whatever, right, is I define my template. Now, there's only one way to define a template in Power Apps that works, and that is to use the Sancho Harker method. I'm going to really upset you all now, because I'm going to jump properly into pro code and upset everyone. A Power App is a big zip file. Inside of that zip file is JSON, OK? He's not a fella down the pub, because I thought he was. This is JSON, right? And when it comes out, it comes out all gobbledygook, gook and you have to do a thing called beautify JSON, which makes it readable. Why it doesn't come out of the box like that, I don't know, right? But when you do it, it looks like this. And you'll notice that inside of Power Apps, inside of the Power Apps files, which if you unzip, looks like this one at the top here, all right? South Coast Summit here. So if you can see that little one up there, there's one called References, and inside there, there's themes.json, right? So when you come out of that, and you open it in here, and you can edit it. Now, what Sancho found, because he's a very, very clever little sausage, is Sancho, he found out that if the type of the thing in here is an X, it's a variable, right? So all of the settings that are inside your Power App, when you hit a new button, right, and it comes up with red, green, blue, and pink, and bold, and font size 7, and all that kind of shenanigans, it's all in here, right? It's all in here. It's all defined in here. There's a template file. And at the very top of the theme is what? Is the template. So you know when you hit that, like, the theme button, and you say change the theme to red, to green, to blue? It's all defined in here. And you can code your own, right? So you see here, we've got primary color value 1, GBL. Well, GBL, if you know GBL, that's, we, we wrote that in the Power Apps Coding Standard. That stands for global variable. So we're setting a set variable inside of a Canvas app so that when you make a new button, what will happen? Any answers? 
it will be, it'll all be linked back to that variable. Right? So let's go and make it, so put that button in. I'm going to come into my Power App, and I'm going to go Insert, and I'm going to go Button, and it's themed up. Right? And that's dead simple, right? Dead simple. Look, let's look at the button. Let's look at the button. Let's have a look. There's formulas inside of the button. Oh, not there. There's formulas inside the button here. There we go. So if we go to the color, it's pointing at one of those global variables at the box. Do you have any idea how much time that saves you? Because you've just themed the Power App off the back of that, right? Now, that's, that's brilliant. Now, when Sancho, Sancho's made the template, it's available on the Power Apps community forum, right? So he's done ha half of the hard work for you using that in, in Sancho's template. But you need to go in and do a little bit more to Sancho's template. Because there's things in there that aren't quite right. So there's things in there like drop downs, there's things in there like forms, making sure the form background's right. There's things in there like the, uh, the date picker header, for example, right? You want to kind of make sure that that one's right. So the date picker, when you have a date picker header, when you come into the date picker, you get the little blow up bit. Well, you can't normally change that, but you can inside of the JSON, right? Because a lot of customers will be like, well, why is that Microsoft blue, Microsoft red, Microsoft pink? Like, you want to be able to define that. So I have themed this up off the back of those global variables. Now, you're saying to me, Keith, but that's, that's OK. But like, what do I do with those global variables? Well, this is one of the only situations where I will let you use on app start. Anyone on, on app start, it's, when you, it's the first thing that runs when you hit a Power App, right? So on app start, you should not put any data sources at all. You shouldn't put any data calls in there. It should only be setting variables, and they're even probably going to get rid of this at some point. So you can see here, I'm pointing at things. Now, for the sake of today's demo, I pointed at some RGBA at the top and the bottom, white, and some off gray. But in between, I've got this thing, comp style primary color one. How's that? Comp style primary color two. And the primary color three value, all that kind of stuff. Well, what that is, is off to the side, we've linked this up to a component library. And in that component library, there's one component, tiny little component, just called styles. It's about 20 pixels wide by 20 pixels wide. We hide it in the corner of the app on the very first screen. And it's just an output. Sits as a component library in the solution, in the environment, and it all points to that. You can just update your component library, and it doesn't update the Power App. How good is that? doesn't update the Power App. It's great. And you're like, why, wouldn't it, why would he say that? Well, because if I go and automatically update all of the Power Apps, and someone's gone in, and they've kind of tweaked it here and tweaked it there, and all the colors just change, and it breaks all the apps. That's a terrible user experience, right? They do that with environmental variables and all sorts of things like that. You need to go through each app and test it out and try it out. So by having a component library do it, you have a much easier streamlined version for the citizen developers and the developers to use. Because you, you, you come in, you turn it on, you can see there's been an update. You're notified of a change, and you can see it, and you can code off the back of that. So that is theming. And it's very good, and it saves you a lot of time. OK, so next, this is the template. So when you want to rezip that Power Apps file, because you've edited it, and you've got to rezip that Power Apps file, please take a picture of this if you want to. This is the PowerShell that you need to run to rezip the Power Apps file. Because if you just rezip the Power Apps file, it will not work. Right? So this is downloading an MS app file. When you re-zip the MS app file, you have to use this PowerShell script. And when you rename your, uh, you, can, you can make this a little bit more loquacious if you so desire. I would recommend you have it in, in a parent folder, because at the moment it only works in the folder that, that the app's in. So you kind of put it in the, if I, was, if I was doing this now, I kind of, I've got my um, app, which is South Coast Summit there. I've got my app zipper file. I've just dropped that in there come in, run my PowerShell, um, and it would say, what's, what's the name of your app? And I'll call it Susan. Um, and then it zips the app back up, and I've got my Susan MS app file, right? And then I just upload that into Canvas apps, and it's done. My template's made. Right? Now, once you've made your template once, you can repeat many. So stick it inside of a solution and use it over and over again. Simple-ish. That one's important. Now. On to my next favorite is most subject. I used to be a graphic designer a long time ago, and I hate ugly power apps, right? 
if I see a l icon on the screen without a little bit of padding around it, I get really annoyed. Yeah? It's like, why would you not make your app beautiful? It takes five minutes. Well, it doesn't take five minutes. That's what the theming is about. So now we've got theming sorted. What do we need to continue to make our apps brilliant? One of the things you need is a design grid, because every graphic designer knows to make something look nice, to make something work, to make human brains read it, you need order. You need a grid, right? Grids are everywhere. You don't see them. They are on every website you go to. This will shock you. There you go. One grid system. They're the grid systems that have been in use for hundreds of years. If you read a book called um, Typography by Jan Schickold, you'll find um, flyers in there that look like nightclub flyers that are from 1920. They look like night nightclub flyers today, they're so modern, because of the design grids, right? Grids are pervasive, they're on absolutely every website. They are everywhere. You would not believe just how many there are. Yes, I'm using Microsoft Bing, I know I'm the only one. Um, but they are on every website, the BBC's got one, and there's lots of them. I've got a five column grid, but normally they're, an, they're always, almost invariably an odd number almost invariably sort of 13-ish um, columns, tends to be the grid. In terms of power apps, you may or may not want that because it tends to be very thin, like the column widths, so you will end up with one or two too many. But you can see like, how you manage to break the screen up, and the human brain loves that, responds to it, welcomes it, helps to note importance and alignment. Now, how do you support that? How is best to support that? So, I've got a number of ways of supporting this. And this is where it all goes wrong. Okay, so. Is that a bit, is that one? That's the bit of one. Right, so first of all, layout containers. New addition to Power Apps, really, really powerful because they do half of the layout job for you, right? They can divvy up the screen into little bits, but you need to understand from a design perspective how best to use them. You can't just throw stuff in there and expect it to work because it will look atrocious, right? You need a gutter, okay? That's the gap down the middle here. That's what the designers refer to the little gap there. That's called the gutter. And you have the columns, right? So you've got a grid system. Use the containers to define that, and you are golden. The problem comes, what did we see a minute ago? What's that? They break the column widths, right? How do, I, how do I account for that? Okay. So whilst I am a massive fan of the Loon layout containers, one of the other things we do, and I do a lot of, is having some form of responsive design sitting in there off of a toggle. Now, this is one of the things that I will, I will use in every single app. I don't know if you've seen them. We use hidden toggles and hidden sliders to trigger all sorts of trickery. Right. So when we want to run a function, we switch a toggle to true, it runs a piece of code. At the end of that function, end of that piece of code, we switch that toggle back to false again. That is our function run, okay? It's, how, it's as close to functional code as we're ever gonna get inside of a Canvas app at the moment. I'm sure they're working on something amazing that you haven't told us about it. So in terms of the screen coordinates, not on change, but on check, because only on true, we're running a very lovely, oh, wrong one. Running a very lovely, Big loquacious statement here. Lots of widths in a width in a width. You'll get used to those in a minute. We'll talk about those. But this is defining all of the um, locational criteria for the app. And it's all responsive. And you see there, I'm not using any funky maths. I'm using percentages, right? I'm not using 2.0.0%, uh, uh, like 0 0.025. I'm using 2.5%, because it's low code, no code, right? Does it all for you. Remember, Excel. Excel does that. Now, we'll, we'll talk about this great big chunk of code in a second because we're going to get onto that. But when that triggers and, and, and fires off, I'm now able to reference that and lay things over the top of it, right? And now I've got a different, I'm going to hide this uh, grid here, this, this grid here. I've got another grid down the bottom. Same, exactly the same grid. It works exactly the same way as the parental grid, as the Power Apps grid control but it's all controlled off of that variable, right? So this is a different container system, 
but running off of a dynamic variable that's been controlled by a slider in the background. The hidden slider is updating. When it updates, it fires the trigger off. It says, update the width, update the width inside the variable. And every time they drag the screen around, it automatically resizes. This is how we used to do responsive design before they brought this out. The difference with this is that you can do really nice things, like that design um, thing I put up on the screen earlier on, where you can lay things across the grid, and it's all perfectly sized in the right place. And you can do really nice things with it. Like, for example, if I want to place this piece of text, and I want to go where the width is. Oh, it's going to put, I've put it in a container to make it easy to hide. But like, there you go. So if I want to make that two widths, I just change that to multiply by two, multiply by three, multiply by four. It's an easy way of me putting the grid in the right place. OK? Nice and simple. You could even componentize it if you really wanted to. And now. <laughs> we shall get onto components. Oh, well, before we get onto components, actually, let's talk about components in two places. So, before components, we used to copy and paste. Right? Don't tell anyone. Um, we used to copy and paste from one Power App to another Power App. It's how everybody has done dual authoring on Power Apps since the dawn of time, since we did the hack at Hitachi. Oh, I think, are you doing that one, Rory? It was like, you know, how does more than one person work on a Power App at a hack? Well, it's copy and paste, right? But there's ways of copying and pasting. So this particular little menu up here is a menu that I have been using time after time after time after time after time. And I just copy it, and I paste it into my app. And to go with it is a little collection. Okay, so let's look at that little collection. Now, the trick here is to have some way of linking it back to what? The template. So we've got the variables put in there already. Because I've got a standard, because I've built a template, and I always use that template with the same variable names and conventions, I can just copy and paste code in, and it's already wired up. I, all I have to do is define where those images are coming from. Now those images, I've, I've uploaded them into the app. But they could just as easily be flipping um, uh, links to blob or something like that, right? It's that simple. It's bring it in. It automatically styles up to the customer I'm working for, OK? And I get that menu built quickly. And it's all responsive, and it's all wired up, and it's all ready to go, right? Quick, 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 quick. Next, components. Right, so jump over to the component library. Here's the component library. We'll talk about components. This is the style component that I talked about earlier on. I have used this for so many customers, it is untrue. Okay? You've got all the different colors down the side there. S sometimes I want them renamed, and it takes a little while, but you know, it's customers being what customers are. Primary, tertiary, sometimes there's a uh, primary color two down the bottom somewhere, because someone wanted, there was only one primary color at a customer a few weeks back, blah, 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 blah. Decorative gray, one, two, three, four. Inside of here is a load of stuff. Okay? There's the RGB value. There's the hex value. There's a description. Why is there a description? Oh, because I might want to actually have a gallery inside each one of the apps when I come to make it new for the citizen developers so they know what they can and can't do with the colors. We've built these out to do all sorts of things, to have like a little picture of an icon with a text with an arrow for it to say, yes, you can use this over text. No, you can't use this. And have that little gallery in the app when they open it so that they've got a kind of a style sheet to go off of, right? You can do all that sort of thing with one of these things. So they are super, super handy. Um, this is like every single one of my apps has that component in it. I, I appreciate that we should go and do it with environmental variables, but I find this the nicest way because it's inside the Canvas app. I can touch it. I can feel it. I understand it as a, as a user, right? Um, things like the header. Now, this is, this is no longer a, a, an, an output variable. The styles variable is purely an output variable. Oh, one thing I should say about the styles variable before we move on. Um, it's a really good idea to, sum, to make a sum of all of the output variables into one. So you can just run a table command and just throw the whole lot out there as a collection, because it makes life easier for people on the other end. Um, mm, headers, the, the header normally has quite a lot of stuff, right? And this is where my number one gripe for um, components come in, right? I've made a component. Great. 
Half the time I make a component and it only saves me about 15, 20% of the time that I needed to get back from making the component in the first place, right? Because there's all these, I've you know, been really clever and I've put all these, now I've got to fill all them out. That's a nightmare, isn't it? Well, no, because I'm gonna do exactly the same thing I've done before. I've got my sister app, right? I've got that component in the app pre-wired up to all of those variables. And not just those variables, but screen locations and all the rest of it, right? So I've, I've almost pre-built the thing. So now my component isn't just something that I bring into my app and then I have to style up. I literally copy and paste it into my app and my speed is there. So I'm now able to deliver a pre-sales thing that you lot have got to build after me um, really, really quickly, really, really quickly. My time to market is super, super fast, right? So, for example, a perfect example of the kind of um, problem with components and, and their, their complexity is quite often you find components getting really, really complex. I personally disagree with making ridiculously complex components that do all sorts of things. Um, I much prefer to get them in the app if you can or have a combination of components. And this is a perfect example of that. So at the top, I have your archetypal progress bar, right? And I want to move from point one to point two, from point three to point four. But that is a component in its own right. Okay? The buttons down the bottom are separate. They come from the sister app that's got the component in it. But it's all pre-wired up together. So I've got a collection that's driving this component at the top. So when I come into the new screen here, I come into the new screen, do, 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 do. invisible. You can see I've got my collection that's driving that component. And I have one thing that I've done wrong here, and if anyone can spot it, I'll give you a prize. Um, but you can see I've got my collection that's driving the, uh, the, the power up. Now, when I, move, when I want to progress that progress bar along one, I would have to write the code every time. I don't want to do that, so I've already got my, uh, my next buttons set up, my next and previous buttons set up, and all I've got to do is to configure the logic around whether the next button is disabled or not, right, for the app. So it goes du, 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 done, right? Uh, it's styled, it's ready. I've just got to label the component, uh, the, the collection at the top to denote how many um, steps there are. But my buttons are ready. I've just got to go into one place and do it. I've got some documentation on how to do it. It's done, right? It's quick. It, it, like, these power apps, just because like the low codeness of it, low code does not mean low complexity and low, co um, low quality, right? It does not mean low complexity and low quality. Yes, they are quicker to build, but quite often they're not because you're still running around. You've got to do everything. You're the developer, you're the, 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 the artist, you're the um, governor, you're the um, interface designer, you're everybody, right? So you have to make them faster somehow. And this is one of the ways of doing it. So for example, with my little with command, love a bit of with me, um, I'm running a patch statement and I'm going and updating that, uh, that, that collection over and over and over again to move it to the next um, stage. Okay? Bloop, bloop, bloop. Cool. Does work. Would you believe it? Now. <laughs> Uh, oh, I forgot to show you some grid things. Never mind. Right. Um, variables. Variables, 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 variables. Um, <laughs> how and why would I use variables over and over again? So you've seen at the beginning I've got the variables for um, defining my app. Now, variables inside of a declarative programming language are a bad idea because they introduce state, right? But I'm not using variables a lot of the time to do what the variable's supposed to do, which is be variable. I'm using them as a constant, defining them as a constant like you would in any programming language. I'm using them as a setting. Now, yes, I appreciate that. It does introduce an element where and you, someone could write an errant piece of code that could go and update the variable and it would change the blah, 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 blah. But you know what, right? This is the best way of doing it that I've found. So I'm going to talk you through. There's, there are some do's and some don'ts of variables, right? Let me zoom in so you can see everything properly on this one. Do, do, do. Okay, right. So 
A lot of people, when they make a variable, they will type a string or a value after the variable. Now, in, mini, bam, in, do. Don't do that. Okay. You are allowed to do that, but you're only allowed to do that once anywhere in a Power App. Only once, once only. This, I'm pointing at the, the global mode, let's say for the screen, is pointing at edit, but it's not pointing at edit as a text string, it is pointing at edit. And when I tap into it, you will see what type of edit it is pointing at. Okay? Form mode. What is form mode? Form mode is an enumerator, an enum, right? And that actually equates to one, zero, or two. Okay? View, default, whatever, 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 right? There are numbers sitting behind that. So I can use some of the inbuilt features of Power Apps, some of the inbuilt enumerators in Power Apps to power my variables, right? So if I've got something I'm switching from one thing to another, and I want to carry the state across, use the enumerators in Power Apps. They are there, and they, you, you, you copy and paste them across. They are always going to work. They are always going to be in the right place. No one can overwrite them. OK, same with view, right? Form mode dot view, form mode dot view. Then, so, got our two types of variables, global variables, that are within the context of the app, and context variables, which are in the context of the screen, OK? There are further hyper-local variables, as I like to call them, inside of with, right? So as with statements I was using earlier on, allowing me to create variables that are just inside that piece of code, and I can use them over and over again inside that piece of code, nested, and I can get rid of them afterwards without cluttering my app up with variables. Now, a lot of people will make a lot of variables. And for me, remembering what they're all called and why I named them a thing is an absolute nightmare because I'm very forgetful. So I try not to write things like app name sausages. Right? I try and do it a different way, and I'll show you why in a minute. This is the way I like to do it. So I like to use this method. So I've got my variable name, and I've got something after it, item type dot rice. Now, what the heck is that? So in my app, I have a nested set of variables. So if I go right to the on app start, right? I'm going right to the on app start at the top. Hopefully it's in there. Right down the bottom, you can see I have these nested variables, right? See there? Nested variables. It's a variable set of names, it's a record inside a variable, which allows me to use dot notation. Okay? So I can do app name dot sausages, and I could have inside of that dot size, dot title, dot color, dot whatever. Right? I can categorize stuff. What does that mean? That means that when I write my code, what did I say at the beginning? One of the things that you will never be able to do in a Power App is the debug logic. Debugging logic is like the hardest thing imaginable inside of a Power App. If I type sausages, if I mistype it, misspell it, dyslexic, spell it with a lowercase s, put a one in it, put a space in it, I'll never find it. You will never find it because the logic is wrong. But if I mistype the name on the dot syntax, I'll get an error. So I'll know where my error is, and I'll be able to find it faster. So that is probably, like, if there's any tip you take away today, have your settings defined somewhere in the app. You can do it on a screen locally if you want. If they're, like, put the, put the variables where they make sense. If they're local, put them local on the screen. If they're, if they're global, put them global in, 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 at the top level. You see, there's all sorts of things, like modal type. You know, now, this is where I get really funky. The dot notation to me, as the app maker, I just need dot notation. I just need dot main. I just need dot sausage, right? Who doesn't need a sausage? But down the bottom, I've got dot error. Well, now I can just turn that, I can just turn that into a string. I've got the string there. Like, there has been an error. I can use that. So it means that I can be super lazy with writing code, because I know that that dot error has got everything I need into it to, in to describe an error. And I can go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. When we looked earlier on at that grid 
control. Where's my grid control gone? When we looked at that grid control earlier on, you see my hyperlocal variables with, 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 screen with, right? They're contained, they're self-contained inside that with statement. They're never going to find their way out into the magic world of power apps. They're in there like angry little wasps in a jar. And they're all getting spat out down the bottom into a really nice, succinct set of variables. Now, I'm using those records, and I'm passing them in. See GBL grid? So GBL grid dot page margins. Well, page margins is pulling from page margins. And page margins is defined up here as a variable inside of the width. So I've got that lovely way of cutting down the code in my app and keeping it all in one place, right? Yeah, it's really cool. I like that. One thing I'll say to you, though, is you need to make sure you document this stuff, where this stuff is. Because it's the next layer of complexity when you're building a Canvas app. Not many people are used to finding setting variables and all that kind of stuff inside of the app. Well, sorry, I say setting variables, not set, like setting a variable, right? Like using a variable to contain settings. I would highly recommend, given the dyslexic nature of most of us lot and the, the, the nature of most Power Apps makers, do yourself a favor. Yes, write some documentation, but do, do them a massive favor. Record a video, like of, of how you put it together, like just just five minutes, right? Just a little screencast, just to show them where you hid all the stuff, because it'll make a lot more sense to them when they come in there, and they'll forgive you for all the transgressions that you made when you made the app, right? So, variables are cool. There is one thing you should never do with a variable, however. Right, there is a variable that you can use, a context variable, the most evil variable in all of Power Apps. And it's this one. See the navigate screen there, navigate. On the last argument of navigate, I can pass in a context. I can pass in a context variable to the next screen. So I can say, hey, Mr. Screen, Mr. Screen, general neutral screen, have a variable. And they say, thank you very much. But it's really slow. It's really, really, really slow. So don't ever use it, right? I don't know why it's so slow. It just is. I accept it for its. Wonderful slow self. So don't do that. They are forbidden. Sausages, anywhere else other than in that start. Now, the last bit, the last bit, this is where it gets a bit crazy. So now I'm using my variables to drive interactivity, and I use them a lot, right? When I was using those updates for the collection earlier on, I was doing all sorts of cool things. Now, let's, let's actually, I'll tell you what, we'll have a little look at that quickly because I want to show you. Actually, no, we'll come down here and do it, because we've seen this one. So, we've got some variables firing off here. When I hit that button, the variables are triggered. And I'm using my .item.sausages, my item.write, my item.tomatoes, right? That's great. I'm defining now a set of variables that I'm using to turn on and off a menu. My menu is a couple of labels on the screen. OK? Great. What do you mean I've got to write this every time? OK? Because if I, if I now click on the one below, I'll get I'll hide sausages and I'll show rice, OK? I'll hide rice, I'll show tomatoes. But let's look at the end one here, right? Let's have a look at the end one. Look at the end one. The end one's a bit of code's different. So I thought, right, I'll be lazy. I won't update the others. I'll just put that one in there, OK? But what you're going to get out of that is a bit of a problem. So this is the variable. Before, it had three records in it. I'll show you in a second if you want to see it. Three records in it. Now I've just got one record inside the variable, which is menu three, tomatoes and rice. The other two are gone. So I can't do any logic off the back of those two. They're, they're dead. They're gone. Right? And I don't really want to have to keep copying and pasting that piece of code, because a professional coder would never do that. You would never do that. You write it once. Dry programming. Do not repeat yourself. Not wet. Write every time. Right? These are proper programming paradigms. These aren't silly little things. These are what the professional coders, the world's best, use to write their code, right? 
So, how do we do it? Well, we have the cheaty way. Now, I'll caveat the cheaty way in a minute, but I'm going to show you the cheaty way. This is the cheaty way. Okay? This is the cheaty way. I might even format it so you can see it a bit better. That's the cheaty way. You can patch a context variable. Okay? You can patch one. Did you know that? No, I didn't. This is part of why Power Apps is so amazingly powerful. And what you have to remember every time you make a Power App, you see where it says lock show menu up there? Here, there's things coming out of the patch statement, right? Every time you call something in Power Apps, something comes out of the function, okay? Patch always returns the schema of the record. It, turned, it, re it returns the current state and any updated fields. So if I was to go and patch Dataverse, SharePoint, whatever, I get the record back that I patched, right? So I've just patched a variable. I patched those other three menu items, and I get those back. So now when I patch, and I just want to update menu item two, and menu item three is shown on the screen, I get back menu item what, two, menu item three, menu item one. Get the whole lot back. And I've written less code. Now, for the caveat, you need to be careful with this one. OK? You need to be really careful with this one. It is ridiculously powerful, but it is also prone to a slight bug, which is you need, <laughs> a slight bug. You need to define your variable, the schema of your variable, in the visible command, right? That's the first way of getting out of the, because you want that schema defined. You don't want to start adding bits to it, because it will turn around and say, the shape of your schema cannot be blah, 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 blah. You also want to be very careful of doing anything with it on a toggle. You want to talk about those little toggles with the switchy switchy? When the switchy switchy fires, when you come into the screen, yeah, you've, got the, you've got the possibility of introducing a non-compliant schema to the patch command, and it will just go, uh, and you'll turn your app off, and you'll turn your app back on again, because you know Power Apps is an idiot, and occasionally you have to restart it. And when it comes back on, it won't work. Like, so it will be all right, and then 10 minutes later, it will just go red again, and you'll, just, you'll be like, Ugh, and then you have to go and take them all out. But it is ridiculously powerful, so just be, be careful with that. Right? So I'll show you a little um, app, this is one I made earlier, um, that's kind of got all these things combined in it together. Do excuse the delegation warnings, that was before Dataverse was a thing. And um, I've, got my, I've got my app, I've got, I'm going to show you how not to do it. So this uh, little edit button there, if I was to use this as a um, proper non, I'm passing this, I'm passing it to the next screen. So I'm going to navigate to the next screen. And I'm going to pass a variable, right, in that context. Remember, I said not to. This is how long it takes. Ready? How long that took? Like that was. It should be instantaneous. Sometimes it's even longer. And I've pressed that button a few times today, so it's probably why it's like being helpful. Here is my grid system. Okay. My grid system is alive and well. It's running inside the Power Apps. In this case, it's a four-column grid because there's four components of the app, right? I split my app up into varying bits and pieces. It looks fairly well organized. I say fairly well organized. It was built for the buses. Nothing's organized on the buses, but um, it looks fairly well put together. There's lots of those nested variables in there. There's lots of those kinds of things inside of the app, right? Now, it means that I can go and grab these bits, copy, paste, put them in, copy, paste, put them in. You have to think like a no-code, low-code developer. You have to think of the ways around it. So please, use context, sense, use nested variables as settings. Remember that dot syntax, because that's what the professional coders use, this, dot that, dot this, dot that. None of them go look up this value and then look up that value and then compare the two strings together and I've typed it wrong. That's bad. Julian would shoot you if you did that in real code. So that's, that's my advice. That's my advice. Make a component, make, a, make a, a template, copy and paste your way out of mischief, and you'll be building apps at speed in no time. Anyone questions? Oh, God, I've confused you all. <laughs> Was it that bad? <laughs> right, well, OK. What's that? That? Yeah, 
Yeah, sure thing, mate. Say again? Oh, oh, Sancho's template is freely available. It's been uh, up there for forever. I'll put another one up there if you want. Yeah, sure thing. I'll, put, I'll pop a link to it on Twitter in a minute. Yeah, I'll put it on OneDrive. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, Julian, it's about like, you know, you know, you've got to think about this from a, like, I, I've forgotten more programming languages than I've ever learned, right? Because I have imposter syndrome and I like to try and learn how to code. And, but they've all got these dry concepts and wet concepts around them. And I found that I was breaking every law inside of a campus app, right? Every law. Um, and I, I just wanted it all kind of wired up. So even, even base components, I was, um, you know, like text fields and the rest of it, having them in that template pre-wired up to a set of controls is just gorgeous. Yeah. And you're a developer, so and, uh, like developers, developers are all terrified of like, making an app look pretty, right? Right? You're all like, I only go, oh, but I'm a developer, I can't make an app look pretty, right? Let me let me just disperse this, disperse this message, right? Hang on. What what's that? What is it? It's a grid. It's a mathematical grid. What do all you developers love? Maths, right? It's just one plus one plus two plus three plus four. It's just a bit of math. You just plug it into the grid and you can make it look great. You don't even have to, it doesn't even have to be that difficult. Just give it a bit of space, a bit of color, just a bit of zen, and just follow the grid. Don't break the grid. You follow the grid, you'll be laughing. Absolutely laughing. And just copy and paste and have it all ready to go. You know? But don't do it too quickly because they'll expect that every time. <laughs> Rory. Mm. Um, the fact that you've kind of, yeah, arguably made it something very different to what it already was in the first place. I mean, is it is there room for them like to just fall over? No, they painted themselves into a corner with it. It's Microsoft's theme editor that you can use in the center of excellence edits the JSON. So it unzips the Power Apps file, rewrites the Power Apps file, and, and, and does it. So they painted themselves into the corner with that JSON. Now, what I will say is the JSON for um, Dataverse for Teams is different. So you cannot use Dataverse for Teams in the same way that you would use, um, you would use the, the Dataverse. Is that the yeah, yeah, like the fundamental underlying um, uh, controls that are in Dataverse for Teams are, are different. Like when you go in there, you'll find that the, the text box is in the text box, is a button is in the button, and this is in the that. It's something else. So you you can go and redo it. You, you also need to maintain two templates ish: one for mobile, one for um, one for tablet. But I find these days with responsive um, design, you can kind of get your way around that. This also really supports responsive it supports responsive design because it makes your code base more repeatable and easier to write. Like the fact that that dot syntax like is just a godsend, right? Like the, the, all of this kind of look up, you know, you kind of stored it all in the collection. Look this up, look that up, look this up, look up. I was like, oh, no, I'm not interested in any of that anymore. I'm looking up settings. I've already got the setting in now. Just use the dot syntax. Makes it makes life so much easier and more governable as well. And you can l literally copy and paste it into a flipping document. And if you want, if you want to go really crazy, you can make an Excel workbook to write the write the code in the first place, and then just paste the Excel workbook into the requirements, into the um, supporting literature <laughs> that you give to the customer. Do you want to really go crazy? That's really crazy. Don't do that. <laughs> Anyone else? Right, well, a bit early. OK. You got any questions about anything else? Anything you want to ask? Any Canvas apps? Demons, you want me to exercise? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
the, the tool set for theming isn't there yet, right? The workarounds that we've put in place are what they are. Making pretty apps is not everybody's forte, but there is a method to it, right? There is definitely a repeatable method and, and like ways of doing it that any developer can do, right? Design is a formula, okay? Like, it's always been a formula. There's ratios in it, right? Any developer knows, oh, they love a ratio. We've got maths everywhere. Hooray, you know? So there, there has to be a way of making it look nice for me. And it, a lot of it is just good old-fashioned plagiarism. You know, go and nick someone else's design and, and tweak it for your own. I've done it countless times. I used to do it when I was a graphic designer. Oh, you go and see something that looked nice, and then you go and replicate it in Quark Express. So it, Mm. Thinking from the MS perspective, like of course there are really components that are important to you, including it, but the cost difference. Could you maybe make an ALM piece that could like some sort of like behind the scenes you can actually do to the core and yep. take it down and put it into like this cost and then and then while you're doing another kind of stuff you can actually do it. So is that very functional that you can do it from within like the components that you have developed? Yeah, you can, you can. And one, one of the nice things about the components is there's, there's two types of components, really, or well, three types of components. Pr um, Power Platform Component Framework, which is high code, as we all know, blah, 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 blah. So that sits over to there. We won't talk about that one. Then you've got two canvas appy types of components. One is a component that exists as a, a, an individual encapsulated component inside of the Power App itself. And then one is in a component library. You should always invariably use a component library if you can, right? When you update a component in a component library, when you open your Power App, you get a notification saying, do you want to bring this one in or not? I would highly recommend making a brand new version of the file and saying update and then go and seeing what it does to it, because you don't want it saving over it. You know, you've got versioning and blah, 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 blah. Nine times out of 10, if you haven't put too much complexity inside of your component, you're good, right? You're good, because you, you're, you're trying to make non-breaking changes when you make a component. You're thinking like a developer, you know? <laughs> like, right, if I take that out, is it supported? It's like API version one, two, three, four. You've got to try and have some sort of backwards compatibility. Um, but genuinely, most of the time, um, if you keep your components simple, you don't need to go and rewrite them again and again and again and again and again. I find myself making a lot of display components, so not necessarily interactive components, but like a lot of customers will want a gallery that just kind of displays stuff on the screen. There's no interaction needed. Um, and a lot of what's inside that gallery is like, like, so as soon as I find myself making things over and over and over again, I'll put some time aside, I might make sure that there's some time in a project plan to kind of make that into a repeatable thing because it will be inside of that app, it will be inside probably another screen, another, it might be used 10 times in the app, it will probably be in five other apps, and then you kind of throw it out there to the internal community in your company and say, look, we've got this new component, would you guys want to test it out, anything, blah, 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 blah. And you need to make it a, a team sport. You know, development is, a, is, a, is not a solo enterprise anymore. Um, so I find that's, that's the best way to do it. And component libraries are really good for that because people can bring them in. And then when you, when you bring the component into your app, you can edit it and it becomes an encapsulated version, an instant, instance of that component inside of your app and you can muck around with it. That's the best way of doing it, to be fair. All done? Yeah, okay, all right, well I'm done. Thank you very much. Yeah.